Um, my name is Justin Olson. I, um, I work with the city of New Bedford, and I am the newly appointed arborist in uh, Chance's recent leaving. Um, I've been with the city for three years, all in forestry and under Chance. So I like to say that I have a minor degree in the School of Perks. Um, <laughs> I came into the city with no experience whatsoever, never even worked a chainsaw. And from that point here, I've, you know, I like to consider myself as coming, you know, long ways. So I let Chance to that. Absolutely. So uh, this is our first presentation in what we call the transition. Uh, we did one, uh, we did a, our, our actual first presentation about uh, two and a half, three weeks ago, it was right at the cusp of me leaving with the city. So for those of you that have uh, uh, known me and we've worked together in the past, um, I was recently the arborist for the city of New Bedford and then got um, promoted to superintendent of parks and forestry in the city of New Bedford. I was there for about seven months before I've just recently resigned. Um, personally, going back to school and continuing this kind of work, which is broadening my horizons, um, so I can very much anticipate coming back into this world um, and just being a little more, a little more uh, versed. So I'm not really going anywhere, but just have changed, uh, you know, positions. I am still a contractor with the city, uh, so Justin and I still work together. We're still very much in communication. Um, so for whatever reason, my email is on the list. If you need to get a hold of me, you can always contact Justin. And uh, together we're learning. Andy, uh, excellent. Um, I don't know where he just. Yeah. Oh, he just. Yeah. Either way, you know, every time he talks, like, okay, I'm gonna write that one down. I'm gonna write that one down. Um, he he's a wealth of knowledge. Um, it's really great. Um, and even interestingly, uh, one of the presentations, uh, one of the webinars that he hosted, I didn't know it was him. Uh, we were just talking prior to the presentation, and I was like, oh, look at this awesome picture of this example of what was done with permeable pavement and all this stuff. And I pulled it up, and he kind of was just like. Yeah, that's mine. And I was like, ah! So, you know, really great guy every time we talk to him. Um, and it's great, you know, Justin coming in. Uh, he's a sponge. So uh, coming here, um, you know, hearing from you folks and uh, how we're moving forward, um, we're all learning. Um, Justin, the same. So we're going to be going a little bit back and forth. It's going to be like a little bit of a charade um, because we're, we're, we're learning together in terms of doing this. So I'm going to turn it back over to Justin. All right. Let's get started. So uh, today's presentation is on a little bit of bits and pieces of what we do, tree planting, um, what forestry really does, well, you know, do for the city, and, uh, you know, and um, how important it is for trees to be planted, you know, I think in all cities, you know, um, the cities are heating up, surrounding areas are heating up, uh, allergies are really bad because of pollen, and, you know, it's just, there's so many benefits from planting trees, and, you know, my main goal is to spread that awareness, so. All right, so New Bedford at a glance. Uh, population, 95,000. Um, clearly, you can see where we are. It's a big concrete mass. Um, that, to me, just equals heat. You know, it's a lot of heat we're adding. Um, heating up the water, heating up uh, the neighborhoods and such. So, um, you know, it's forestry's aware of this. We're doing our best to get as many trees in the ground as possible. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more about details and when we plant and such. Um, there are our goals. Uh, forestry as a crew, when we're not planting, we are mitigating hazards. We are removing trees, most, mostly uh, Norway maples and you know, pear trees. They are very dangerous, as you can see here. Down on the uh, right side here, that's a Norway maple that is, you know, typical Norway maple. So uh, in the uh, summer and the winter time, we're trimming, we're removing, um, stumping, we're always busy. And um, in the spring and summer, I mean, uh, spring and fall, we are planting trees. We, uh, we have goals to meet. Uh, we have 500, 500 trees a year that we like to do, uh, 250 in the spring, 250 in the uh, fall. And emergency response, uh, that's, that's our bread and butter right there. That's what we, it's another thing we pride ourselves with. Um, emergency response, quickness, you know, opening streets, you know, in case trees are falling across the streets, and, you know, keeping people safe. Down power lines and such. Yeah, and if I could add, yeah. um, with the uh, three main goals, you know, we feel um, we feel privileged. You know, when we speak with different communities about what they have in terms of their DPWs, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, you know, yes, we are a city and we're surrounded by um, more suburban and rural areas. Um, we feel privileged to be able to have five staff full time focusing on trees. You know, we we don't hear of that often. Um, or if they do have crews, they, they've been contracted out, they bring in a deity or they bring in a private contractor. Um, so, you know, Justin's job now and what was mine was really 
training my staff to do what I hear is happening tomorrow with Liz, with the Fall River DPW. That's so crucial. The folks on the ground that maybe have never had that formal training. So yeah, we have three main goals in terms of you know what we're doing in the field as a, as a crew of people. Um, a big part of that is you know a, a fourth potential goal we maybe should put on there is is that public education, and I think um, Justin's doing a really great job at continuing that and expanding that. Uh, being here with you folks today is really kind of helping us flesh that out again. Uh, you know, referencing back to Andy, um, just being able to. Uh, speak at length about, you know, the benefits and what Liz was talking about, um, you know, it goes beyond aesthetics, and that was, that's a really an underpinning of what we're talking about here. I mean, I, I'm assuming most, not everybody in this room would agree with that and, and understand that, um, but to the general public, maybe they don't. And so when the, when the messiness question comes yeah. up, like, you know, Andy's sitting here, he's like, I don't care, he, he's just saying, he's like, I don't care, yeah, that's messy, live with it, love it. And he I love that enthusiasm, and I think, again, we, we agree with that, um, but we also probably have the same, um, experiences of people, you know, very, very upset, like in tears upset. Um, it's amazing how upset people get about, you know, the messiness and the potential for things that have, you know, to happen. I don't know if it's Fox News or what, but they just, they're just shaking in their bridges when it comes to like the, the mess of trees. So, um, so that, that would definitely be a, a fourth main goal, yeah, awareness. All right, why trees? Like I was just saying, you know, pollutants, uh, trees absorb that stuff, they, you know, hold on to it. Um, other than looking good, you know, they always look good. A nice tree is a great benefit. Real estate boosts the house uh, value. Uh, road noise uh, blocks. Um, you live by the highway and you have a bunch of trees, so that, that noise gets cut down by a lot. It's very important, especially in cityscapes. Uh, wildlife habitat, um, that's very important as well, you know, bringing back some species that aren't really here anymore. And, and I'd like to add a little thing. Are you folks noticing, again, very much this is, you know, a, a conversation. Um, being a wildlife guy, being you know a naturalist person, are you folks noticing? Maybe I'm just noticing it more, but the the raptor population, the hawks are everywhere, taking out rats, taking out pigeons. I've always seemed to be, I've always thought I was observant of what's going on there. I'm seeing them now more than just the red tail on the highway. I mean, the the kestrels and the falcons and the, I mean they're everywhere. And you know, the more I've researched it, you know, more they like to nest in large conifers. So our parks are really where we're seeing. That so we have the nesting locations and then you know there's plenty of pigeons to go around <laughs> you know so uh, that's to me it's, that's one of those things I, I'd love to learn more about if any of you folks have any thoughts interests uh, or information about that I'm, I'm all ears. Uh, another reason for uh, wide trees is you know stormwater everybody knows about that that's one of our first pitches is controlling runoff soil erosion you know more trees the better off we are with that. Um, Heat island effect, that's another one that everybody's pretty much aware of. It's everything's heating up, you know, so things are getting affected by that. So and more canopy cover and such. Yeah, and if I can add again, you know, we're from, and I'm gonna speak, you know, we are from again, I'm still a contractor of um, we're from the water department, first and foremost, and we're reminded of that. We, you know, and I'm sure other people tell us the same way, we work for the highway department. We have we have umbrellas that we have to answer to, we'll call it. Um, so us with water, water is our everything. And so we're, you know, even here today, getting credits for what our MS4 regulations, you know, the state is really asking us to step up both our public outreach, but how we manage stormwater and um, resiliency modeling and how are we going to really um, push the bounds of, yeah, we're looking to assist species moving forward when we're talking about trees, um, but how do we use trees and how do we maybe not use trees in terms of right tree, right place for working with our stormwater systems and our sewer systems. A lot of the you know inquiries that we get, whether good or bad, are about sewers in the sewer lines, trees in the sewer lines. You know, we're looking for some really great peer-reviewed articles uh, regarding do trees, you know, are they the opportunists that find the crack in the sewer line, or are they the you know perpetrator that creates the crack in the sewer line? That I I'm yet to find one. Haven't done too too much digging. Um, I'm almost scared of what I find, but. Uh, if we could find one that supports saying no, they're more the opportunists, and your hundred-year-old pipe is, you know, that had a target on its back 50 years ago, maybe that's more of an issue. Um, so again, if any of you folks have anything on that, we'd love to we'd love to uh, continue the conversation. And uh, if you see down here this eye tree tool, um, I didn't even know that existed until I came to this last year. This this is really really you know I really learned that, and you know I learned what the purpose of that program was for, and um, I can recall many a projects where uh, trees were asked to be, you know, maybe, you know, the poorer ones to be removed. 
chances thought mm, maybe they could stay and his supporting details came from my tree um, you know Lucas tree on County Street you know that's a that was one of them oh, yeah, yeah I had, to had to bring that up because uh, <laughs> you know the information on that website really drove home what that tree could really do for the city and, um, and, and the background of that is uh, city mayor wanted to you know put in this little park it was kind of a it seemed to be a political favor and whatnot the tree was in the crosshairs beautiful well-established um, locusts um, it had a, a what I call a sister locust right across the street it was one of the only spots in downtown city you know of, of the city that um, had these really stately trees and they were gonna literally bulldoze it to put in this establishment whatever the case was and I used I tree like no here's the dollar value this is what it's doing for the city this is you know this is ridiculous like let's put rash with you let's, let's think about this logically and they're like, yeah, we can do that after you cut the tree down. Right. And I was just like, and again, who do we work for? And it was just like, okay, yep. so we move forward. Um, very few times, especially in my three years with the city, was I ever, my hand was forced in that. You know, typically they give um, us the final say on the tree. This one, unfortunately, didn't have that one. Um, and I am always quick to bring it up. Um, but using iTree tool was very great. And they had their reasons. Um, and we've moved forward from that. But I think it was also a big learning opportunity for all of us that there are tools out here where we, we, we you know, recommend to everyone to use them if you haven't already. It's a good tool for awareness as well. Yeah. So as I said before, uh, we plant 500 trees a year. Um, the mayor uh, requests that we do that. He has a specific list, um, and we just follow that list. Um, we have the Green in the Gateway City Project, and we'll get into more of that a little bit. And uh, Adopt a Tree Program, that's something that Chance really started for the city. Um, very important. We'll get into that one as well. Um, as you can see here, this is the... Uh, Initiative, 500 trees, folks on main thorough um, fairs, um, spots heavily traveled, um, trees, you know, make the city look good. So, um, and we do comply with the ADA, um, so that way there, people can move freely down the sidewalks with the trees that we plant. There's a question. Oh, oh. Yeah. I was just wondering, so who determines the list of 500? Is it the mayor personally, or is it a or is that do you guys it's get to the mayor's office? Yeah. The mayor's the one really kind of personally behind it. Right. Um, then he'll bring a lot of us into the room. And again, right. they're so supportive of the, the administrative is so supportive of trees. Which, and then uh, echoing what Marianne was talking about, um, in the past it, it wasn't so. You know, for, for one reason or another, um, whether it was a funding thing or just a leadership thing, um, the trees and I, you know, I try to use the word you know sparingly, but it, they were neglected, and we can just kind of keep that in quotes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, him, uh, the mayor, the current mayor, and his staff, and, and others in the city, other uh, city leaders, came together and they go, let's put together a list. Let's put together a list of, like, the areas that were the high traffic. You know, we used to have, you know, most of them um, had the perspective, had the history of, I remember when this was, and then fill in the blank. And so, like, let's try to get back to that. So when my kid is now sitting in the, in the you know, a booster seat in the back seat, when they drive down it, they can have that again. So the list, to answer your question, is, is usually a culmination um, from the from the city leadership, and then they'll give us the list, and then you know the expertise will come in and go, okay, this will work here, this shouldn't work here. We have, you know, of course, we're second to the dig stage. Well, we have you know 114 kV underneath here. We don't want to go here. So that happens, but typically we have a master list that we start from, is like the, the basic template, and then from there we're able to kind of uh, mix and match depending on what's going on. So we tend to follow best practices, and it doesn't get on political. Um, in, in terms of the individual where trees planting. go, no, just deciding where trees get um, yeah, planted. Practices. Luckily, you know, and it sounds like a lot of these, what, again, with the gateway cities, a lot of these, you know, post-industrial cities, the whole thing is, is is up for review. So anywhere you're putting them in, you're you're already, you know, moving forward. Right. Um, you can kind of just close your eyes and point, and you know that there's an issue there that you either need to mitigate or or just move into a better direction into the future. You know, so so hopefully we answered your question. So um, we don't have exact information on that. Um, a lot of it is, you know, um, some of it is grant related, which comes from the Green and the Gateway City project. Some of it is out of our actual operating budget with um, Department of Public Infrastructure. And then also there's been, and I don't know the details of this, there's also been support from the state and that's all on the whole. You know, at, at our end we get the state support. Um, but I don't have any specifics for you. And the only reason why I'm, I'm answering this is because, again, new to the situation, I have more of the perspective to be able to answer that, but I couldn't give you much details on that. And then also the adoptive tree program, which is growing well. Um, it, it's a 
smaller percentage of our overall tree planting, but that's a funded from the residents directly, point A to point B, tree in the ground. Um, the match comes from the city in terms of the labor costs, um, and that's that's getting better every year. I have another question over here. This is a little bit of what it looks like. Um, we get a shipment of trees, usually 50 per shipment. We offload at a specific location at our um, at our office, our, you know, DPI there. Um, and then once they're organized, we like to keep them shorts and talls, you know, for those that don't know too much about trees and the species and how tall they grow. And then from there, we'll dig safe. We'll do, um, you know, whatever street we pick the plant on, we go out, we mark them. You know, as long as it follows that ADA, we'll saw cut. That's me. So, uh, that's myself uh, cutting the asphalt there. Uh, we mark it out in white paint. You know, once it clears through dig safe, then we just start cutting, and we'll pop it with a backhoe, dig the holes with the backhoe as well, and offload. And as you can see down here, that's the crew putting it in. Um, we're very careful. We make sure that you know it's everything's good to go. The root clear is exposed. Uh, no code on that stem going on when it's on the ground. We like to give it a nice trim, and then we just roll it in. Yeah, so um, like when we did this presentation a couple weeks ago, you know, different folks have kind of different, um, you know, thought processes about what happens at planting. Some people say, you know, don't, don't uh, prune at planting the first couple years on the establish and then prune. Um, there's others like myself that believe that a little, one little snip, one little snip to kind of just step the tree in the right direction take out any cross branching, right at pruning to me is, is a really great um, great way to kind of set it in motion in the right direction. Um, the guys follow the best management practices in terms of removing cages, things of that nature. Most of the city, as you see here, the soil isn't, it's amazing. This is beautiful farmland that all of a sudden just kind of got built upon. You know, we only start seeing the layers. Um, and like you say, like the like archaeology, you only see the layers of Rome when you're in the actual downtown area. The rest of it, up until the boom of the late 1800s, was all farmland. So we, we uncap that and you just see it, it, it it's waiting for us. Um, with that being the case, and if I could add one thing, you know, where we want to go, this is what I would call reactionary planting. What I'd like to do is to be more proactive in terms of the engineering and the planning. We're using, you know, structural soils, because we all know. I mean, we're, we're giving this thing a five by five, you know, um, you know, a cut in the ground. And yes, the soils underneath it are, are um, you know, conducive to plant growth, but all that asphalt's going to get popped up. And when people ask us, you know, we're not going to lie to them. We know in you know 15 through 30 plus years we're going to start seeing sidewalk lifting potentially. Um, in the better soils, we hope that the tree's going to you know choose to go kind of out and down as opposed to start buckling up. Um, a lot of times, of course, when we see the uh, buckling sidewalks, you see the you know um, girdling issues. So by you know doing proper planting in the beginning, we're trying to mitigate that. Um, as we move forward, we really you know look to we're going to continue the conversation with Andy about using structural soils and really engineer underneath the sidewalks for the trees and not just kind of come in after the fact. You know, we're really trying to catch up on decades of, I'm just gonna, you know, I, I try to stay as tactfully as possible, um, of less than tree focus. Um, as we move forward, you know, I think we're really going to, you know, change it right even from the beginning of all this. We'll know what's under, underground before we even start digging. Um, uh, but the guys do a really great job and we've been enjoying it. So, no, but we know because the city does have brownfield sites. Um, we know particularly we have uh, environmental stewards who work for the city that do a lot of the um, you know uh, hazardous waste type testing stuff with the soils. We know certain parts of the city where it's a little more um, let's be careful, guys. You know, let's make sure we're you know cleaning our gloves off, tools off when we go home. Uh, sadly, it's kind of around our school area, which is amazing. Um, whereas other parts of the city, like right here, we just we just know that um, prior to literally this house being here, it was it was fields. So unless something happened. Um, we feel pretty confident that there the soils, they may be lead, you know, especially with lead and fuels. Um, we know that we're going to have a, a, a lead um, contamination issue, uh, but no, we do not test, you know, frequently by any means. Uh, Green Gateway Project. Um, this is a fairly new project to the city. Um, it's funded by, you know, as you can see here, the EA. EA um, aims to plant 1,800, you know, inch and a half caliber trees, shade trees on private property. Um, we find that there's a lot of backyards that have the potential for trees to be planted there, but, you know, nothing exists, or it's all asphalt back, uh, backyards, as we've noticed. Um, 
don't, I don't have too much to add. I know you have more the details on that. It's a newer project, so we still, we haven't, we, we've only literally put 50 trees in the ground under the green and the gateway. So we were literally just starting. We had a, um, it's, we're the first municipality that's doing it solely. Um, whereas others, it was always a, it was a hired um, contractor that did it or the nonprofit that did planting. So each time they do, each time the state comes down and chooses a, a gateway city to do this project, um, it's a different model. So we're trying it as a fully municipal model. Um, with that, we found we ran into a little bit of staffing issues, union issues, uh, which say the nonprofit didn't have to in the past, or um, and we like to try to follow in the DCR model, um, being another um, you know uh, public entity. So we're we're just kind of getting over that hump, and so we're anticipating this spring to really start rocketing. Uh, but my, and I gotta just add this, and I'll turn it back over. My favorite picture is this little one behind you on your right, and uh, that was a little um, American chestnut cultivar, uh, which I, I can't recall offhand, um, that we got from a, a nursery who believes they have the closest to the American that you can get that's still um, resistant. So we planted a couple of these up in our waterworks. So in addition to our city, we have um, a large chunk of land that surrounds our, um, you know, uh, open source reservoir up at Quiticus. And so up there, there's a whole different ball game and we're literally just starting to kind of crack that shell open. Uh, but this is uh, one of two chestnuts that Justin and I planted kind of on our own time, out of our own pocket, because we really think that, that we're going to start slowly kind of changing the mentality. You know, you talk about pecans, I'm a, I'm a big mass producer kind of guy. So um, with a, with a acorn picture I threw up there, you know, I think I find that to be important. So that's why I love your enthusiasm. Like, yeah, they get messy, so what? That's cool. The adopted tree program. This is something that I believe Chance has created himself. Um, this is a you know resident funded um, initiative. Uh, if a resident wants to purchase a tree, we do have a list um, that they can pick from. Or if they're they want to bring their own to the table, we consider it. You know, we go over the you know, you know pros and cons uh, for a $200 uh, tax deductible. Tax deductible. The city will you know do the pick the tree and we'll put it in for them. And you know they've had great success with that. And we mm -hmm. still have bunches you know tons of calls coming in yeah. left and right. Um, yeah, I'm curious to see, you know, because I'm unfortunately not there now every day. I'm very much be staying in contact with Justin. I'm curious to see what the numbers is. Every season it gets more and more and more. Yeah. It's, I wouldn't, we haven't been doing it long enough to see the data to see trends, but clearly it's a, a growing model. Um, you can see our numbers there in terms of how many people have enrolled and uh, uh, approximately, and these are approximate numbers um, that we're up to today. It's kind of touchy because people see, and we'll be fully honest with you, you know, people go, you're planting them for free if you're going down Rockdale Boulevard, but yet you're over here on Oak Street, I can't have one for free, and we go, you know, the funding that we do have, and to the gentleman that just stepped out, um, the funding that we do have kind of has been earmarked for Main Star O Affairs, which I believe is Chapter 90 type stuff, you know, from the Mass State, um, potentially. Um, so we try to, once we explain the benefit, most folks go, yeah, no questions asked, how about this, I'll take two. You know, so it seems to do well. Um, this picture right here, I want to uh, make note of. This is another one of my favorites. These are my, these are my guys. Um, th this is planting the first uh, tree of the 2015 season, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe it was the first tree of the 2016 season. It's a swamp white oak, and so we're talking about phenotypic plasticity. This tree, I was going to say something, but I knew it was going to come up in the presentation. When we planted this tree, um, the first year leafed out with nice, large, beautiful swamp white oak leaves. This past season when it leafed out, I was like, ooh, you know, so it was 20, so I think it was 2015, so it was 2016 when it leafed out. All the leaves, and at first I thought it was like a drought issue, but this is a very wet part of the, um, very wet part of the uh, park. There's a large hill, this Hazelwood Park overlooks um, Clark's Cove, really great area. Uh, the person, the woman that uh, purchased the tree, you know, lost her son uh, in a tragic incident, so she was doing it as kind of a memorial tree. Um, I helped her pick this species because she was unsure, so we kind of helped guide the decision. Um, when it leafed out, all the leaves stayed small. Beautiful, healthy, well-developed, but they're a lot smaller, and we believe, I believe, it was my first real example of watching that, um, you know, plasticity happen, the high wind area. You can even see the trees all kind of have this lean tool. A little bit of flagging going on in the trees behind us. That wind comes off the southwest over that ocean. Um, it roars over there, and so I believe that it uh, has to do with just the high wind, just goes to smaller leaves. You know, and then of course in the summertime it does dry out. So right here in the spring, this, you know, a little bit of mucky soil, but then it really dries out and that wind comes howling off there. I was really concerned that the tree, luckily we planted it, staked it well enough, and had such a large root ball, that it, it did fine in terms of not leaning over. 
Um, but it, to me, it was a real, I think of that one when we talk about plasticity issue. Um, so yeah, again, another great treat. Um, yes, yeah, so actually I've received three phone calls in the last two weeks for uh, adopted trees. You know, people are, residents are interested, so it's a great program. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I, I was wondering, do residents then maintain the trees? No, we, we can do it. Or if we encourage them to water it, you know, um, on their own time if they like. And that's, that's part of the agreement. When we ask that they water it, especially the first two years, really allowed to soak down. You know, we always say when you're enjoying your morning coffee, you know, go outside and water the tree is always part of the, you know, the conversation that we have with them. Um, and, but it is being, you know, being a public tree, is a street tree, we do kind of take it into our, you know, uh, you know, roster of trees to be maintained. Um, but of course you get the, you get the residents to be, they're more bought in. And not only are they bought into that tree, they're now looking at all the ones down there. I think it was really great, um, with Liz, when you were talking about the increased surveillance, you know, we talk about it and we understand the concept, but you, you put it into words and it, it, it did, it kind of hit me like, oh, you know, that's true. And we've always thought about that. And we see it on day to day to actually vocalize like, no, like, like we're actually getting, that'd be a great study to just show, you know, how there are more eyes out there because that person's out there with their morning coffee watering that tree. Or when, you know, Halloween comes, they're the ones watching out to make sure if the table, toilet paper is not flying type stuff, you know? Uh, so it was really great. I think it was the first presentation I've seen where they, where it's been said specifically that personal buy-in was really important. So, was that, oh, sorry. Was oh, that, did they, so they adopt the tree, did the trees have to be planted in a public either, can they be in yards, front yards, are there any right parameters? Uh, street trees. Uh, oh, be on, yeah, because we don't, we can't go into backyards. And we do get that question a lot. You know, can, can I have one in my backyard? But we, we keep it to the street. Yeah. So I, don't, I don't think we've also, it may have come up, but it was very loose. And so, of course, we're trying to get folks to invest into their uh, neighborhoods and the street trees. Because again, funding, funding is fickle. It comes and it goes, you know. Um, so it's great that they were able to step up to, you know, plant the city tree. So we do, we try to, you know, put them in uh, the, the streets and thoroughfares. We've actually had a gentleman purchase enough trees for his whole block. Oh, we have, yeah, we have some yeah. folks. And he owns a business, and, you know, he, he's savvy, and he's like, you know, and of course the tax, you know, tax write-off, he, he's, you know, he's not done. Um, I think he's, you know, uh, purchased 12 or 14 yeah, trees. Roughly and yeah. he turned it, he turned it pretty, um, a pretty urban street, three tenements, ear to ear, very, I mean, not, not a place that I'm going to be often to, to the same lately, and then he has changed it around. I mean, we put Hawthorns and Hawthorns on one side underneath, because of course underneath power lines, yeah. they're directly underneath, and yeah. this is a unique picture we'll talk about. Um, the Hawthorns are on one side, and then we put Elms, particularly on the other. Um, when we switched up in terms of some varieties, um, the street is just night and day. The street is just night and day. So it's, and, and he, you can tell he's kind of walking around like a, like a puffed up chicken, you know, he's, he's happy about it, and that's awesome, that's what we want, so. And so, did you want to talk about those bushes? Uh, like the that? bushes and then also the selection, you know, this was a unique spot. Um, and again, I'm, you know, taking it from Justin, um, just because uh, it was my choice to put these here. And yes, it was my choice to put the locust and some people kind of raise an eyebrow, like, well, you see those power lines right there, right? Um, the locust, I like, I like the architecture that you can play with, with certain trees, you know, um, with an elm or with say a tulip tree, you know, you're going to try to really get that um, you know, straight up and down, and, and that's that's it. Whereas the locusts, especially this is also a high wind area, so our intent is to try to keep them lower and really get that angular wood out of them. You know, really make it a four season tree, um, and really try to just slow down the whole area. This street here is like Indy 500, um, so we're really trying to change the whole um, the whole uh, kind of perception of the street itself. We had a really deep sidewalk. What I wanted to do was take out the entire strip, the whole way down. Um, but there's a there's a water line right on the side of it. So at first I was like, this is going to be a no go because of dig states. Like we have a water line right there, and then but being the water department, it sat down in front of the commissioner like, listen, you know the mayor would like this street to be planted up. Really, I'm only planting on the other side of the street comfortably. But on this side, we have the opportunity to plant some. So I kind of spaced them out a little further. We can plant some here. We have a water line right there. Do we want to take the risk? He said, absolutely. The water line isn't that old, and in this part of the city, it's very deep as compared to other parts of the city because it's further away. Our city's long and whatnot. So at this part of the city, it's very deep um, because it's in the far south. And so he's like, you know what? Do it. He's like, you know, my my predecessor might want to kick me in the face for this one, but you know what? 
go for it. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna take this on a case-by-case uh, -case basis, roll with it. Um, I showed the trees, you know, the wires are set back a bit, so we're gonna play with this. So there's about six or eight trees here that are kind of our, um, our experiment. Um, with it, we put some of these, uh, what are they? Um, what do we put underneath there? Um, the bush, we had them left over from another project um, that I was like, you know what, like we have these large tree wells and I'm all about intercropping. I really want to get, um, I'd like to continue, again, I think on my backswing as I call it, I really want to look into what we can put as ground covers. Um, I was watching a great documentary last night about mosses, you know, really pushing the bounds of what goes in the well itself. Uh, maintaining mulch is great and it's necessary for a plethora of reasons. What can we do to really um, kind of push the bounds on that? Um, so here I put these bushes and I figure out what they are. They're very, they're very common. What are you going to say? I'm like, yeah, of course that's what it is. Very hardy. You can take a beat and you can chop it back. It comes back every year. We're just trying it out. This was very much our experiment, and uh, we're going to live with it. Yeah, is it ornamental? Or it's ornamental. It's uh, not a wigelia. It's a. Uh, no, not azalea. I don't know. Spirea. Spirea. Thank you. Spirea. You know, it's everywhere. You put it in the landscape. Um, it's kind of like that that one that you can kind of you know set it and forget it. This one we chop it back. It keeps coming back nice and dense. Um, unfortunately, it does catch the trash. You know, so there's one there's times where I'll be driving down the street. I did it the other day. You know, once BPI, always BPI. Um, I drove. I was driving down the street, and it, you know, it collects trash, but that's okay. Because now instead of it blowing to our oceans, the plant grabbed it, and I was able to pull it out, and that's okay. I think you know we're going to see it slowly spread. Um, and it also pulls the people out of the house. Come on down, you can come water it. Like, this isn't, you need to be a cookie cutter type, like, only this to go take care of it. Um, so I just want to say, as my really handing it over, Justin's doing an outstanding job, and I'm gonna let him finish it up. Um, you know, you know, I invite you to, to really, you know, help him move the city into a, a you know, continue in that direction. You know, I, I feel as though I kind of helped start it. He's really taking it wholeheartedly and really moving forward with it. He's excited about it. He's engaged in the public. Um, you know, I very much hope that today's the first of a um, career-long relationship you build with him. All right. So, any more questions or anything like that? Go ahead. There's a question of boundaries with those little wells. Has anybody been talking about rain gardens? Not that I am aware of. Um, James, do you remember anything? Yeah, but not in terms of the tree wells itself. Um, we have a couple folks, uh, local garden clubs, that want to do them around public facilities. Um, one of the buildings that actually work out of now, um, interestingly, uh, they want to put in a, a rain garden about that. A lot of it because going down with downspouts, and again, being the water department, um, our, a lot of our rain gutters are focused into the, the water service, so trying to direct those out of their things into the other things. Um, so there's conversation about it, but not in terms of the street tree planting per se. So of course, we know they're very much connected. Once a week, we like to try. You know, we have two uh, great watering rigs, as Chance uh, calls them. Uh, they hold a lot of water, and we just take it street by street. We just, you know, make sure the wells are nice and level, and, you know, make sure that the stakes don't stay there too long, and just make sure the tree is looking good, not interfering with traffic or pedestrian walkway. So, yeah, we, we do go back, and we do maintain. Pull so weeds and such, so. So, again, we shoot for a week, but if it's longer, that's the nature of the beast. Right. Um, and it's different with the adopted trees. You know, we really try to, just because of the sheer volume of it, we really foster the conversation when we plant the tree with the homeowner, like, we're really relying on you to do the watering, so, because those are the residential areas, so when he just said, he made no, when we plant these trees, it's a, it's, a, it's a street, so we know from here to here, water, so we can send one person in the truck and they can take care of it, so it's able to stay in terms of that rotation of the one to two week, um, Whereas with the adopted trees, they're scattershot all over the city, tucked away in little residential areas. So we wouldn't, we'd be lying if we said we went back every week, or you were able to. So we really rely on the residents to do that. And to this day, I don't think we've lost one from the adopted tree program. And that's been starting since our, our day one. So usually the first year, it'll eke it out. But now three years later, we're still seeing great success. And I mean, you kid, they put daffodils and little white fences and yeah. dogs no pooping signs. I mean, they go, they, you know. Yeah, they, they definitely personalize them. Yeah. 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 So. They look good. Um, is cutting concrete? Always on the table for planting location. Is it always on the table? Like, do we always run into that? Or like, is it just always an like an option that you have? Um, I mean, if we need to cut it out, we'll cut it out for okay. sure. I mean, but we run into a few planting spots where we didn't have to cut any concrete. But 
Yeah, most of the time we do have to cut that out. But so, so I'm not sure if I understand the conversation or the question of um, is it always on the table? Like, does it always have to happen? I just know that in a lot of municipalities, that's a big challenge. And if oh. there's concrete there, asphalt, Can there's I? no tree that's going to go there. We love it. Yeah. I pull up concrete like birds build nests. I love it. Yeah. Um, we are no, I mean, we are well versed in removing it. Um, that doesn't even phase us in terms of can it happen, will it happen. Right. Um, there are spots, though, especially more north in the city where it becomes a little more suburban, we do have the nice wide, you know, uh, grass ribbon. So it's not, so the, I wasn't sure if that was the question of do you always have to pull concrete? Because that's oh, not the case. It, is it always something no, you we'll, can't we'll, do we'll pull right concrete right? and we'll do it. Yeah. We, do, we have a system down there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All of our concrete is recycled. Yeah. Um, so we, we have a system in place to make it quite nice. Right. Um, so, yeah, I love pulling it up. But again, you're unearthing yeah. that, that, you know, agricultural soil that you just, and then you get there and it's just, yeah, beautiful. I'll go over some right. of the compaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your crew is helping Right now, we have a crew of five. And uh, that's we've planted many trees with five, six guys, even less. So and, we have a system. That's and also on cool. the other end of the spectrum is, in terms of like we get seasonals, and then also oh, yeah, right. you know being part of a crew of 165. Our Department of Public Infrastructure is quite large, uh, well versed, and we take pride on being able to do everything in house. We very rarely have to contract out on anything, right. whether it's from electrical to you know sewer cleaning to construction, bridge building. And we do, we try to do it all. Um, if need be, we do these things what we call all hands on deck. Uh, we've had we've had 30 guys out there, you know, 30 personnel, I should say, right. um, and they'll just. I mean, we 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 rally the horses and we'll go down. And we will plant 40 trees in a day um, with our oversight, and they do a great job. And you can tell they they like it. And we like when we have to go help them out. We'll use our crane to go help them. You know, we do have a crane in our um, division, so we are very much versed in being able to do all of that. And that's truly our strength. And I truly hope that in your conversations with the, the other DPWs, um, if they're not doing that, uh, they they should be. You know, that's, that's really, we couldn't do what we do without the support of our, you know, uh, sister divisions under DPI. Yeah. So. Yeah, forgive me if I missed it, but did, did you talk about setback planting? Or do you do, you do setback planting? Uh, what do you mean? Um, so, uh, you know, in Massachusetts, a tree ward is allowed to plant up to 20 feet off the right of way mm -hmm. on private property. Okay. No, um, so to answer that, I'll just, again, I'll say no. We try to stay in our city layout. In some of the areas, not particularly unfortunately the ones that you've seen, um, we do. Depending on the street, it's different as to how much of a setback we have. A lot of times it's 8 to 10 feet, so it's nice. We do have what would typically be lawn, what we're able to kind of bite into. Um, and typically we get the support of the people. Um, so yes, it's still on our property and we don't necessarily need their consent. They typically usually open arms with it. And if they are open arms with it, we might even push it back a little bit more. We had a school, uh, Nazarene Christian Academy, um, where I saw where the line was, and it was one of those like a simple knock on the door I think could really make this better. Sure enough, I went in there, I um, spoke with their uh, principal, and said, you know, Here's our lines. Well, I can put it here, but it's so close to the sidewalk for the tree standpoint. Like, you have this beautiful strip between your parking lot. Can I just kick it in a little bit? And they said, Glad you asked. You know, have at it. Yeah, so we now it. were able to send yeah, it yeah. back. So that, again, with everything, that relationship, um, you know, that communication, conversation really can help us do that. But no, we to answer your question, we don't go off the public property. And of course, we have the records as to what's lost. All right, I'm going to just uh, have to stop. But you, if there's any more questions, you guys can keep continuing it. Um, we have break right now, and there's uh, lunch, uh, light lunch out there for anybody who wants them. Um, we're supposed to meet back at 1, but maybe 105. I know Jason's running a little bit late. So uh, you guys can keep talking if you want, but there's a light lunch. Uh, and there's forms to sign if you haven't signed yet. Thanks, folks. <laughs> Hard to keep with lunch. <laughs>